This is the November edition of Operation City on the Hill. I'm your host, Robert Maynard. Up until now, we've been doing some historical shows that, that I believe set the grounds for the principles that, we're, that I, I believe are important to um, successfully transition into the digital economy, which we've been talking about a lot. And I, I believe that the key to doing that is looking back to some of our principles that were a key part of our founding and part of, part of what is referred to as the Jeffersonian age. That's why we titled the show Back to the Future, because I think we need to look back to some universal principles to um, address issues that are coming for us, before us today. Now, I've watched hours of footage or video of World Economic Forum, and they're talking about the digital age, and they're talking about all the challenges that we face. And so far, I have yet to see a parallel made between the trends that we're heading for in the digital age and the type of society we had prior to the rise of the industrial age. Now, let me just go into this for a minute. One of the, one of the trends that they talk about in the, in the digital age is the gig economy. And the young people like this. Is instead of lifelong employment for a large institution, large company, and you have this career, you're, people are going from one type of job to another. And people who are raised in the traditional industrial age economy, this seems unsettling. You know, because it's, but for, the, for young people, they like it because it gives them an opportunity it gives them more opportunity. There's less security, but there's more opportunity. So a lot of them like it. But the commentators on this see this as, as a problem. Another related issue is that you used to educate yourself for a certain career. And you, you, you go to school, and you get educated, and you get a certain, a certain degree. And education was equated with schooling, and schooling was supposed to prepare you for a career, which is, you know, you're set. Now, you have to constantly re-educate yourself because the, the ch challenges and changing are going, and you, you, you pick this up, or you pick this up, you, you, you do these gigs, these different um, employment here, and a little bit of employment there, and so you have to constantly re-educate yourself. So that, that was another thing that they're not referring to. And then there was there, um, the loss of manufacturing jobs actually has been blamed on, oh, we've got low wages in developing countries. But that's not really the issue. The, the, the issue is automation. And we're being able, actually, production-wise, we're actually producing more than we did during the time when we're seeing, where we're, um, when we, we point back to the age where our manufacturing was dominating the world. But actually, we're, in terms of output, we're still making a lot of output, but we're doing it with less people. There's, at IBM, when I was at IBM, we they used to refer to it doing more with less. Now, does, do these changes foretell a lower employment in the future. I'm not so sure they do. Let me, I, I'm, my argument is that they are paralleling the way economic life was seen in the Jeffersonian age. It was, instead of having large, during the industrial age, we went from an economy that was largely, people were self-employed um, they had schooling, but education was a lifelong thing. Then we didn't equate schooling with education. Education was something you continued, and you you had small um, self-employment, small family-owned businesses, and you, you you shifted from one type of thing to another. And as the opportunity arise, it was an opportunity-seeking society. And, the, um, and during the industrial age, we got used to becoming taken care of by large institutions. You did large governments, large school systems, 
large businesses. And so we've gotten used to this idea that these large institutions are going to take care of us. And so we became a society that's seeking more towards security than opportunity. Um, the opportunity is there in the, industri in the information age and in the digital age. A lot of the problem is that we have a lack of preparation. A lot of companies are experiencing the fact that you have X number of layoffs or you, know, you get rid of these number of people employed, but then you have positions need to be filled and they outweigh the number of people that have been laid off in many times. But the problem is that they are positions that it's hard to find um, skill matches for. And we're, we have a society, people are expecting to be retrained constantly, so they want some. And so we, we have a workforce that um, is in a transition period. So it's, it's kind of scary because you're used to lifelong employment. You're used to security. You know, your company is going to take care of you for life. But the, now there's the necessity to be retrained can be scary, but it can provide us with an opportunity. And this is where we need to, as a society, we need to embrace the opportunity and mitigate the, the insecurity that it's going to create. Another, there's another issue. Um, I think this is the personal empowerment that comes with the decentralization of society, potentially. Uh, when you have, let's go into manufacturing. You have something like, something called 3D printing where you can print out material in, in the format that a printer would print out letters on a page, but you print out 3D objects and you can, it's called, another word for it is additive manufacturing. Instead of, instead of sculpting and taking stuff away, you're adding stuff to it and you can actually create a lot of stuff this way. And it's, said is in its infancy and is possibly going to re revolutionize manufacturing. You're going to have the big manufacturers are going to be doing using this more, so they're going to be using less of the traditional manufacturing, putting things together that way. And you're going to have small mom and pop <laughs> manufacturing commodity items. And so you're going to, the just-in-time manufacturing is going to take on a new lease and you, instead of having one large plant, you're probably going to manufacturing a, a whole large quantity of certain items. You're going to have a lot of small um, entities manufacturing come up, special in items that are made to someone's um, particular interest. There's, there's still going to be mass, man mass manufacturing because you have goods that people buy in bulk. But the amount of diversity, the amount of um, customization, whether this new form of manufacturing, is going to allow for a lot of consumer empowerment, but it's going to allow for a lot of personal empowerment for, for um, those who see the opportunity as something that outweighs the, the risks involved. So, so you have that. That's what tied to that that's going to it's going to do two things at the same time the information age is going to allow small individuals and family based groups and large small companies to reach out globally because you you can reach globally through information but it's also going to at the same time the economy is globalized is also localized if you can produce something quick right here then your local people are it's a, they, you know what they want, so you, you, specialty items that people want can be produced locally a lot faster and a lot easier, especially with things like the new, the new manufacturing technologies. The um, information technology is going to make the, this kind of thing bigger and bigger part of what we're doing. So a lot of people are wondering, well, okay, how is this going to empower people when you have the possibility of artificial intelligence bringing new life to the, t to the concept of Big Brother? 
And that's a good question, and I'd like to take a few minutes to address that issue because in China, they're working overtime on this. And chi China is um, going into the digital age with a, I'm not going to, maybe we can do a whole show on this sometime, but the, the possibility of controlling a whole society through information technology and through gaining information on them and being able to control what they can purchase and, and what, what their credit scores and all this. The, the credit, credit score becomes related to how subservient they are to the, to, to, the, to the government. So this is a problem. And there is going to be an attempt, not going to be, there already is an attempt to by large centralized powerful governments and other organizations to use the technology available, the data available, in a way that is going to go against the centralized, the decentralization trends and which empower the individual. So the question is, how far are they going to get with that? And I, I personally don't think, in, in the long run, I think they're going to lose this battle. And one of the reasons why I think they're going to lose this battle is something called blockchain technology. Blockchain chain technology is a method of storing data. It's much more secure. And if, you, if you're familiar, I'm going to use an analogy. If, you, if you're familiar with networks, you have a client-server network and you have a peer-to-peer -peer network. A client-server network is where all, most of the information are stored on these large computers called servers. And then the information is shared out and distributed to this network of clients and the clients all tie in. To, you know, you get an internet service provider and you, my internet service provider is Comcast. And these internet service providers have a s large servers and they control your access to the internet and to um, a lot of data is going online. The cloud, you talk about cloud, cloud computing. Is on, is, everything's going online so you don't store the stuff on your hard drive anymore, on computers anymore because everything's online. Well, the problem, potential problem with that is that the centralization of that method of storing data makes you got a couple server farms, you know, Apple, Google, you know, you, a limited number of companies who have most of the server farms and most of the storage. And so there's a high degree of centralization in the way data is stored now. And there's also a high degree of insecurity, your information getting stolen. People run into this problem all the time because it's the, the, the way of um, accessing data it's not as secure as it could be. Enter blockchain technology. Blockchain technology, which is catching on very fast, is a whole different way of sharing data. Instead of storing the data in these large servers and then parceling it out from the servers to clients, you have a peer-to-peer. -peer, you have a, the network of, sh of direct c contacts among the millions of people who are part of the network. And they, the, the, no single centralized server has control over the data that the network itself has control over. And there's built-in security technology that is going to um, make this, the issue of identity theft much, much less of a threat, which is going to make it popular because a lot of people are they're terrified of their identity being stolen. So as this technology becomes more widespread, the ability to control through artificial intelligence or some kind of that global data by whether it be the Chinese or anyone, our government, Russia, whoever, it's going to become less and less, or even lar some large companies. You know, you, George Orwell was 1984, you had Big Brother watching you, you had the corporations and government hand in hand. So that, in the long run, is going to run up against a new form of storing data, blockchain technology. Now, blockchain technology is best known as the technology in which Bitcoin is based. Bitcoin is a currency. It's a, that's what people have got, um, became familiar with blockchain technology. So you're going to have, that's one example of the, the way um, this technology is influencing 
the way, the way we trans the way we interact with each other. Currently, your financial transactions are highly centralized, controlled by large banking institutions. Um, you have these national banks, you have these global banks. They control a lot of the financial transactions that go to and fro cr across the globe. And a lot of people feel that you can't really have true freedom unless you free up the financial system. Con centralized control over finances has been seen by a lot of figures on right and left as one of the key reasons, the key impediments to human freedom. So as technology allows the transfer of financial, in, whether it be Bitcoin, whether it be something, I'm, I'm not selling Bitcoin, I'm not doing a promo, promo for Bitcoin. I, I like the technology, I like the concept. It doesn't mean that Bitcoin itself is gonna be the, the future, but I, as more people get into this, their transactions are not controlled by a central source. It's harder to track. And so they're in that you have more control over it. It's, it also makes it harder to tax, which may, makes large bureaucratic organizations like governments run, run on taxpayer dollars. Questionable way of organizing human, human interaction. So this is, um, I'm, trying to lay the groundwork to a return for people who say, well, the limited government and local, you know, communities and civic society and churches and family, and all, that was, that's all back in 19th century. It's, this is you know, digital, new, new, new era. We don't, we don't, we, we, we don't operate that way anymore. Well, I'm arguing that we are moving into an age where we're going to be operating that way. And uh, instead of controlling, they're one of the big questions. You have a huge amount of opportunity. You have, oh, they're, they're doing some, some groups now are starting to explore with asteroid mining. You get trillions of dollars worth of rare earth minerals on near earth, containing near earth, near earth asteroids. And there's companies that are being set up to go and mine asteroids. Um, there's the energy sector. Um, some places are starting to, it's not commercially viable yet, but some people, some companies are starting to experiment with more energy out than in when, when it comes to fusion reaction, which was the holy grail for a long time. They still haven't made it commercially available, but this, it looks like some of them have broken through the scientific barrier that once thought was impossible. So a lot of these, a lot of these um, breakthroughs are the har harbinger of a golden age of opportunity, of potential for a lot of wealth. Now, the question is, what happens to the people that are having a hard time transferring transitioning into this new age. You're gonna to have to reform the education system. And I don't think a one size fits all government schooling approach is the way to go. We have a lot of um, talented people in the school system, but they're caught in, a, in you know some of the teachers that you know, my, um, I go to these teachers conferences and I get the, 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 the teachers, a lot of them are interested in interacting in all kinds of different ways in their experiment on it, but I, I still think the institution itself of schooling is, could still go a long way towards moving back towards education rather than just schooling. There, there is something called hyper learning, which the information technology makes it possible where you can have learning it's not confined to the classroom and my, my son gets more out of google not google i'm sorry youtube than he does either from me or from me i taught him originally and he used to come to daddy but now he's telling daddy things <laughs> so it's it's there's a lot of there's a lot of potential and 
we can supplement the school system. We can't, you, you can't put it all in the school system. And because I, I don't think the school system is set up. Uh, you you, you got to look at it more than just schooling. You got to look at it as lifelong education. And I think um, hyper learning and the, the use of our technology to become an educational tool. And how do we find a way to harness the interests of the kids, kids to educate them on something? Like, for instance, they're into these video games. And the video games have. There's actually scientific principles behind it. My, my son comes to me sometime and he's asking me about time travel. And so we start talking about the laws of physics. Or, you know, now I was an engineer, so I studied physics. So that's, But it's, there's no reason why we can't create a mentorship program with, through the digital technology and height. Um, have entrepreneur, parent, teacher, student, community coalitions. Um, I'm, y y this is something that if you're, if you're going to make sure that the, the people don't get left behind, you're going to have to rethink how society itself is organized. And I think instead of trying to regulate a global economy, which I hear a lot of people saying we've got to regulate. Somehow we've got to regulate this to make sure people aren't left behind. You can't regulate this, especially as the technology makes it harder to track because it's going to be peer-to-peer. -peer. Now, the peer-to-peer, -peer, it's like the computers. They're so ubiquitous now. Everybody's got one. And if it's not a computer, it's a device that operates like a computer is that hooks, that's connected online. Everybody's got it. It used to be a time where that was a that was the possession of a few. Well, the blockchain technology is going to be the same. It's a possession of the few now, but it's going to be ambiguous. Everybody is, is going to, as, if it keeps accelerating the way it has been, and it looks, if anything, I think the acceleration curve is going to pick up. And when it does, the idea that you can regulate this and control it by a centralized global political authority, or national authority, it's absurd. It's not going to happen. So what we need is a restoration of civil society. And that's, if you go back to the previous shows that I was looking at, they went back to historical examples. You had, on one hand, you had the um, New World Order, which was an idea that goes all the way back to Rousseau. And it was basically, we're going to create these politi global political institutions to create harmony and peace among nations. Madison and the founder says, no, that's a ridiculous idea. It'll cause a global tyranny. What you need is to create a government that's going to hold the people accountable to, to the people. And then you have the people need to be reformed intellectually and morally. So the real solution to world peace and to free and all this stuff like this is a moral revolution. And the last show we did on the Quaker's view and the Quaker's role in the abolitionist movement. And the Quakers were also um, peace proponents. And so my argument is that what we need is a global moral revolution. A more, in other words, if you can't regulate a society and you don't want a society to fall apart, then it's going to be held together by shared values. And when I, when I say moral revolution, I'm not talking about a particular church or a particular synagogue. or um, Religion at its core, religio, to bind, to bind one to transcendent. It's to go beyond oneself. That was how... Um, a lot of our founders under, understood that Jefferson and Franklin and people like that, they were not Orthodox Christians, but they uh, respected the transcendent aspect of religion as crucial to prompting the individual drive, the creative, if we're, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident and all men are created equal, and they meant by the human being, male and female are created. If we have if we bear the mark of our creator, then we are creative beings. And this understanding gave rise to a society that saw themselves as created beings and looked for potential. But it was also communal too at the same time. So the r religion properly understood, according to the founders, that considered religion to be essential to, free, to a free society gave one access to transcendence, which gave one creativity and ingenuity and a, this, the push, the engine,
to go, you know, to reach the stars, go beyond oneself. You don't have to go to a religious institution to do that. The founders believe by nature, human beings are religious beings by nature. We seek to transcend ourselves. But at the same time, there, you transcend yourself by reaching out to others at the same time. So it's not just the sole individual isolated um, from his peers, but properly understood, the religious experience creates community. It creates individuality, but it creates community at the same time. So the idea of individual initiative and individual excellence and communal values being at logs with each other and you have to rein in freedom in order to have communal values, it's not true. It doesn't work that way. It's, as a matter of fact, you try to regulate, you're going to destroy them both. You're not going to create community by bureaucratic regulation. You create conformity, you create a collective, but it's not community. And so we're going to be pursuing in future shows this, this understanding of the interrelationship between human individuality and personal dignity and communal living and how you can prepare ourselves to take advantages of the opportunities of the information age digital economy while not making sure that our uh, people who would, would otherwise be left behind don't get left behind, that we, we bring them with us. And again, I don't think this is going to happen through political regula regulations. I, if anything, that's just going to kill what's happening, you kill the opportunity and enslave the people. So we, we need to um, find the kind of energy that created a global abolitionist movement to abolish slavery and apply that to create a global movement to ease the transition into the digital age so that we maximize the opportunity and minimize the risk. You can't totally minimize risk because without risk there's no opportunity. But you can make sure that people are ready to take on that risk and find that opportunity and that they have the tools necessary to, to assert their own dignity and prosper in this coming age and I as we step forward next next time we're going to talk about there's there's a acronym called SCARF there's status certainty autonomy rel relatedness and fairness and these are acronyms that, that they use to to motivate people in businesses now we're going to tie this tie this into civil society and how this could be used to regulate civil society Thank you very much, and this has been the November edition. I'll see you next month. This is Robert Maynard signing off for City on the Hill.